Good afternoon and welcome to the Royal Society of Tasmania's Northern Branches 2020 Launceston Lecture Series. My name is David Morris and I'm Acting President of the Branch and have much pleasure in introducing our presentation this afternoon. The Launceston Lecture Series here in Tasmania is sponsored by the City of Launceston's Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery. The title of today's presentation is Chemical Answers Now, Protecting Us and Our Environment. And it will be delivered by Professor Michael Bredmore, Director of the Australian Centre for Research on Separation Science. Growing up in Northern Tasmania, Professor Bredmore graduated from the University of Tasmania with a Bachelor of Science in First Class Honours, followed by his PhD in 2001. He was awarded the Doctor of Science by the University of Tasmania in 2017. At the University of Tasmania, he's made a continued and sustained contribution towards miniaturized analytical technology for clinical, forensic, environmental and food applications. Professor Bredmore is one of, was one of three finalists in the Eureka Outstanding Young Researcher Award uh, in 2011 and has been listed as the analytical scientists power list of the top 100 analytical chemists in the world in 2014, 2017 and 2019. Professor Bredmore is pioneering the development of portable and transportable technology to provide chemical information when and where the sample is collected. And applications include the detection of homemade explosives at airports, the continuous monitoring of nutrients in our rivers, and more recently, whether we can use these to detect viruses. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Bredmore to the Royal Society of Tasmania's 2020 Launceston Lecture Series. Professor Bredmore. Thank you, uh, David, for that introduction and uh, thank you to the Royal Society for uh, inviting me to give this talk and for actually letting me give this talk. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of this land and to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging um, and to welcome uh, any of the Indigenous people around the world who might be listening uh, today, tomorrow um, or whenever uh, you may be listening. Today, I'm going to talk to you about some work that we've been doing for about the last 20 years now um, on making uh, portable chemical measurement systems. The reason for that is because we are now in what I'm calling an information rich society. Uh, the advent of smartphones means that information is now uh, available to us at a scale um, that we were never able to access before. Um, and that means uh, that we are able to uh, do things like use a QR code um, to actually get information on this church that we might be walking around. We have more interactive apps that uh, will use our proximity uh, and the camera in the phone to actually tell us points of interest around us, what we might be looking at, um, even the directions to the nearest toilet. What it can't do is tell us exactly how many calories are in this orange. It can tell us approximately how many are there um, based on the picture, but it doesn't have the size and it doesn't have the nutritional value of the orange. To get that, we actually need to physically engage our phone with the orange. And that's a lot of the technology that's currently missing at the moment is that direct interface to what we want to sample. So we have no way at the moment of obtaining whether or not this uh, particular piece of sashimi is, is safe to eat um, or whether this water um, is uh, safe to drink. To do that, we actually need some kind of way to measure the chemistry or the biochemistry within these particular samples um, to tell us that information and to allow us to make decisions. There are a couple of um, areas or technology that are available for um, information where we collect the sample. So the picture on the left is a blood alcohol meter. This is used by policing authorities 
to determine whether or not it is safe for you to drive a car. The uh, bottom uh, picture on the, on the right um, is a diabetes blood glucose meter. So this is used by diabetics to measure their blood glucose level. Um, and from that, uh, to adjust the amount of insulin that they take. And that allows them to live a perfectly normal life. The third example there is a little bit different. It's a home pregnancy test kit. Now it doesn't change uh, the fact that we're preg pregnant, um, but it allows you to know that information at a time scale that is earlier than it would take to get into a doctor and have that result confirmed from a laboratory. Um, and that lets us make just choices and decisions about our life um, at an earlier stage. So there are a whole heap of areas where having that information can allow us to make decisions um, that will perhaps make us safer, uh, will allow us to live a healthier life, or will allow us to just make a choice um, of what we might have for dinner uh, that particular evening. Aside from these three examples, there's not too many more around. And, and that's because most of the uh, applications are really very complicated. They're done in a central lab using something called chromatography. So this is a simple video showing chromatography. This is on a piece of paper with a green dot at the bottom. Many of you may have done this experiment with some colored ink in school. Um, as you can see, these, this, this green dot has transformed or been separated into four different molecules of slightly different green and yellow colors. So this is what we would call a separation. In this particular mode, it does this by interacting with the chemistry on the surface of the paper um, and the chemistry in the liquid that's actually being driven through the paper by um, surface tension. This is a very fat, powerful form of separating molecules, but it's not the one I use. I use one called electrophoresis, which actually uses an electric field. The video that you're seeing here is a real-time separation of some DNA fragments. This is much simpler than chromatography to implement in a portable system because all we need is a power supply and they are very small and portable and use uh, not very much power. The resolution that you can achieve, i.e. the ability um, to be able to resolve different molecules in time, becomes much greater with an electric field than with a chromatographic system. So for those two reasons, that's one of the reasons why I prefer and have spent most of my career so far using electric fields. So this is the current analytical workflow, starting uh, from our house where we would collect a sample. We would then place that in an envelope or a package and send it to the laboratory where it would then be analyzed. In our lab, we would use electric fields, but in other labs, they would use different pieces of technology. My research group actually works in all three areas of this. I'm not gonna talk to you today about what we do in a laboratory a setting to make things really very quick when it gets there. I'm gonna focus more um, during the transit and the at-home collection and even uh, the at-home analysis. So working with a company in Melbourne called Trajan Scientific and Medical, we have developed what's called HemaPen. So HemaPen is a very simple handheld device shaped like a pen um, that will allow you to collect four uh, blood samples and will store them on four pieces of paper um, for very precise measurements of your blood. The process is very simple. Um, so you hold the pen horizontally and touch it to your uh, blood spot on your finger. You then place the clap on, a cap on and wait for a click. And then you turn it upside down for about 30 seconds. Um, and when it's turned upside down, that just improves the contact of four separate pieces of glass tubing. So they're about this, this um, maybe one centimetre uh, in length. Um, and they house a very precise and accurate volume of blood. As you can see here, we get errors of around about 5% on very small volumes. So from two microliters up to about 20 microliters, depending on the size of the capillary tubing that's housed in that pen. There are four separate measurements. Um, so we have uh, duplets and backups um, and enough there to run multiple analyses, depending on the type of information that might be being sourced from uh, your blood sample. And of course, this whole uh, collection is done at home. Um, and because the blood is then stored completely within the pen and on paper, it is uh, preserved so no one can get to it uh, and it can't degrade um, and there's no biological hazard uh, from the particular blood sample. 
So we think this has got um, a, a lot of potential for changing the way that we regularly monitor the blood chemistry and our well-being um, and health status. But in terms of analytical process, we still have to send it to the laboratory. And while we send it to the laboratory, we still waste a lot of time. So we thought a few years ago, is there any way that we could actually try and utilize the time that it takes to send that blood sample to the laboratory and anything we could do to make the analysis simpler once it got there. What you're seeing on the screen here is an electrophoretic separation. So again, using electric fields of four dyes, fluorescent, different fluorescent molecules in a material that's something like cling wrap. So it's a very thin film, about 10 micrometers thick. And over the length of that, so from the left to the right of the screen, we apply an electric field and it causes the charged molecules to move at different speeds. And as you can see, we can now resolve those molecules from each other, um, which means that when we now get it to the laboratory, we've actually already done some of the sample treatment um, that would be required for that analysis. Because this cling wrap type film is perfectly dry, we have no need to worry about liquids. We have no spills to worry about. We have no concern about the direction in which it's in. Um, and it's also perfectly compatible with that hemopen notion of uh, a precise volume of blood um, and the, the transport process. So this is what we did in our laboratory, uh, a very simple system. Uh, you can see on the left of that top panel there is our, our instrument, so to speak. It's simply a nine volt battery with two electrodes uh, and a ruler um, around which that film is placed between those two electrodes. You put a drop of blood on one end of that, uh, that film, you let it dry, and then you package it up in a bubble wrap uh, envelope and send it to the laboratory. Um, we did it from one campus to the other, from the university down here in Hobart, um, and it took 24 hours, I think it was actually a little bit longer than 24 hours, from when we sent it to one lab to the other and we could do the analysis. What this means is, uh, what we're able to do is we're able to separate some small molecules, so things like um, therapeutics that we might be taking from the blood matrix. Um, and that's a really important part of all laboratory analysis for pharmaceuticals. So the process we've got here really starts to streamline the process up at the laboratory, which of course means that things are quicker, we get the answers quicker to the questions we wanna know, and we can potentially reduce the cost involved in that, making it cheaper and more affordable, which means that we can do it more frequently. So that's the current analytical workflow and what we've been trying to do to improve that. But coming out of that notion of what I talked about earlier, those, those three devices for chemical information now, we really wanna start looking at the future workflow and that is to be able to get the answer that we want within a couple of minutes. So the rest of the talk today is going to be on the, the work that we've done and the different platforms and technologies and applications to provide chemical answers now at the point of collection. So I'm going to start continuing on that blood analysis work. So the current gold standard laboratory analysis of a blood sample is by something called liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. These cost anything from about $200,000 to a million dollars, depending on um, what you're looking for um, and really how much money you have to spend. The table that you're seeing here is one of six tables from a review published in 2012. They did a literature review of every single validated method for pharmaceutical analysis by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So in this review, they uh, went through something like about 500 methods um, and listed them all in this review. Now, this is just one table. And what I want you to look at is the column on the right, which says sample preparation. So all of these analyses require something like a protein precipitation. Um, so that's when you have your blood sample, it removes the proteins and leaves the therapeutic or the pharmaceutical that you're interested in, in uh, the, the residue that's left. A liquid-liquid extraction is where the drug molecule that you're interested in is extracted into a separate liquid and you can collect that for analysis. Or a solid phase extraction, which is abbreviated to SPE. So that's where we stick the molecule that we're interested in onto the surface of a material. We wash away all the things we're not interested in and then we recover from the surface the particular target that we're looking at. What you'll see from, from this column in this table, and this is equivalent to or applies to all of the 
uh, methods in this paper is that they all require some kind of sample treatment. So you can't just take a blood sample and put it in this million dollar equipment and get an answer. You have to do something to it beforehand. And when you have to do it, that takes time and it makes the processes really complex. So to give you an example of one of those processes. So this is uh, a literature method for tamoxifen. So if you wanna do this at home, you have to take one mil of your plasma. You have to mix this with 200 microliters of phosphoric acid and one mil of water. You then need to add 10 microliters of an internal standard and vortex it. You then have to condition your solid phase extraction column with methanol, phosphoric acid, and then you can wash your sample on. And then after you've put your sample on, you need to wash it with more phosphoric acid, some hydrochloric acid, some methanol, and you need to dry it. Once you've dried it, you can then recover your analytes in two milliliters of ammonium hydroxide in methanol. And once you've done that, you then need to evaporate the methanol. Once it's evaporated, you then need to redissolve the solid that's left in 50 microliters. And you need to do this all at home on your kitchen sink. After you've done all that, you then turn uh, from the kitchen sink to your million dollar mass spectrometer that you've got next to you and you inject it. Now, once you inject it into the uh, mass spectrometer, you get your answer within about two or three minutes. But you can see from this process here that this is not going to work. There is no way that this is ever going to be feasible to do at home um, in a simple way that's going to be cost effective. And so that means we need to think of a different way to do it. We can't just take the approach that we've always taken. It's not going to work. Um, it might work. We can technically do it. But the cost to actually get this to market and be usable is not going to be viable. So a different approach is recommended. So we came up with the idea um, many, many moons ago now about using molecular filters. So this is a paper uh, published in 2004 that shows that in the middle of these two microfluidic channels, you can see the membrane. Now, if you apply an electric field from one side to the other, um, and that's in panel B, where you can see ground to H V, you can see in panel C um, that you can then concentrate a protein, um, because it's so large it doesn't grow through the membrane, onto that particular membrane. And then if you change in D uh, the voltage into a different direction, we can move it down a different uh, channel. Now this is really good if you're interested in proteins, but it's also good if you're not interested in proteins because it means that we can remove the proteins from the sample. Now a lot of um, those methods in that table that I showed you had a protein removal step. So this is a way that we can remove the proteins, but it's a different way to what we currently use. This is a way that is actually really potentially amenable to portable analysis. But one of these is good. If we can use two of them, and if we have different size thresholds in those, then we can actually potentially concentrate smaller molecules. So this is the device that we've made here. So channel two is where the blood sample will go. In between channel two and the central channel that you can see on the right is uh, some small channels, and these are nanometer in size, that stop the blood cells and the proteins moving through. Small molecules will move through. So the schematic in the, the figure here shows fluorescein, which is what we've used as a model pharmaceutical. Um, and then we have this other V on the other side. And between that central channel again and the other V, we have even smaller nanochannels, which allow the small salt molecules to move through, but do not let the fluorescein go through. So we can act actually now concentrate the fluorescein molecule in the middle there and also remove it from all of those problematic things in the blood sample that we don't want. So I've got a video here showing you uh, what this looks like. So you can see that this is two, this is a mixture of two fluorescent dyes, an orange one and a green one, um, and that's been placed in the blood sample channel. So you can see as uh, the voltage is applied, those two molecules move through into that central channel. Um, and you can see that they get brighter and brighter and brighter as more and more move through. So this is the concentration part of the process. So we are now extracting these uh, pharmaceutical-like molecules into this middle chamber um, where we're also slightly separating them. You can see the green and the orange are separated, but that's not our motivation here. Our motivation is to remove them from the proteins and the blood cells. You're gonna see in a minute the voltage you're gonna switch 
And those two molecules are gonna move very quickly down that channel and they will separate. You can't actually see the other V um, here um, because there's no fluorescent molecules in there. So we've zoomed down a little bit so you can see the channel a little bit better. And there they go straight down that uh, fast channel. So I've actually got a still shot to show you what that looks like because it goes so quickly. So you can see the separated green and orange dyes now. And this has been done as you saw in maybe about three or four seconds after that concentrating bit. So that just shows you, again, one of the reasons why I like using electric fields is because we can be very quick about what we're doing. We have a detector at the end of that channel and what we get as a function of time is uh, we can see those dyes going past at different times um, and the time at which that dye goes past tells us what it is. So you can see here in the black trace, this is what we would get from a normal microchip injection. And then that red trace is what we do, what we get when we actually do that double V injection where we concentrate the molecules in the middle. So you can see that we've actually concentrated those two fluorescent dyes about a hundred times in one and a half minutes. Um, I've challenged many people to show me how they could concentrate dyes in this way um, from a blood sample as quickly as this. Um, and no one has ever been able to meet this time frame and this concentration factor. So the more we can concentrate, the lower the detection limit we get and the more things that we can detect um, in the blood sample, which makes, of course, this much more useful for a whole wide range of applications. So this is some still images now showing that we do actually separate those small molecules from the protein sample. So the bovine serum albumin or the human serum album, albumin um, is on the left, the pharmaceutical-like molecule in the middle, and those small salt molecules on the right going all the way through. So we've applied this um, for the treatment of sepsis. Um, sepsis is uh, where uh, your bloodstream becomes infected with bacteria. And this is really critical in infants. Um, so these uh, are very vulnerable people. Um, the fatality rate here is really critical. So you can see here, um, there's a three to 40% fatality rate for early onset. So that's in the last six hours. So if you don't get to them in six hours, um, you're going to have um, a death on your hands. The first line treatment here is ampicillin and some aminoglycosides. Now the problem is um, that people or infants who are, who are in the intensive care units um, are not all the same. So we don't know the right dose to give them. We don't know whether we're uh, over prescribing and over prescribing is bad because you get therapeutic effects and also starts to lead to uh, bacterial resistance strains. Underdosing, also not getting the right amount, means that it doesn't actually fight the bacteria. So that's also counterproductive. So getting the dose correction as quickly as possible is really important. So what you'll see on the next slide here is again, our normal microchip injection. So this is a drop of blood that's been spiked. Um, uh, so what I mean by that is we've added, deliberately added some of uh, the uh, antibiotics um, to that blood sample. And you can see the uh, double V one on the bottom here where we get very clear peaks for those three antibiotics. And so this is in about two minutes of when we put the blood sample in, we were able to purify them from the blood sample, we're able to concentrate them and we're able to separate them and now quantitate how much of each one is there. So we'd be able to do that with five or 10 minutes, which means that if you have an infant that was presented with sepsis, we would be able to, over the first, first say, one or two hours, um, measure the individual levels of the, th the, 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 the drugs that we've given, establish an, an individual pharmacokinetic profile. And from that, we would be able to modify the dosage to be able to ensure they actually have the right dose to maximize that therapeutic treatment. So that's one of the areas that we've been working on um, in terms of trying to make ourselves safe and protect us um, from getting sick. One of the other areas that we've been working on is uh, the detection of explosives at airports. Inorganic explosives became prevalent in the early 2000s uh, to the mid um, 2010s. As you can see here, they've been used frequently to great effect by terror. Um, Australia was influenced in uh, the Bali bombings in 2002, um, where there were two suicide bombers and a car bomb 
Um, and I think it was about uh, 70 to 80 Australians lost their life um, in Bali. The marker irons were first detected using a benchtop system back in the Australian Federal Police Labs in Canberra. And that was collected off the clothing from victims uh, who were at the bomb site and just got straight onto a plane and came back. So if you think about the time of a flight from Bali to Australia, and then the time to collect the clothes samples from the people to get them to the lab and do the analysis, we're sort of talking like about one or two days to be able to do that in, a, in the best case environment. So it would be really nice to have some technology to be able to take to a scene where we would be able to detect those explosives. So we purchased a commercial instrument at the time. It was the only one uh, available. Um, it's currently not available. And um, there may be some good reasons for that in that it wasn't as portable as the manufacturer said. So you can see on the left here, um, the silver box is the electrophoresis instrument. That's very portable. The whitish box on the left there is the detector, which is not very portable at all. That in itself weighs about five kilograms and requires mains power. So not super portable and useful. The silver box runs off its own battery for about three hours, but if you don't have the detector on there, it's not particularly useful. That wasn't such a big problem for us because we had built our own detectors. And so what we did was we put our own detectors onto this instrument to make it fully portable and fully field operatable. Working with the Australian Federal Police, we were able to go and test that. Um, and so the testing device, as you can see here, is a plastic drink bottle. Um, there's some paper towel uh, at the bottom to provide a little bit of air. Um, and then the main charge is uh, above that with a detonator in that. We would uh, suspend that plastic drink bottle um, above the ground. And then you can see these collection plates uh, placed around that to collect some debris so that we would be able to check that our uh, instrument and methods are able to detect those explosives. Um, the uh, bomb uh, database center uh, technicians detonated those devices and you can see on the left there a little bit of the plastic bottle flying out um, the photographer did a very good job on this one um, and so this is the size of explosion that you actually get from uh, a plastic drink bottle so um, it's it's not super powerful um, but uh, in certain places um, it could be used to to you know very significant um, uh, outcomes um, if you wish to this is the aftermath of some of those explosions. And you can see here that uh, um, in the bottom left there is the bottom plate. So that was about 30 centimeters under um, that explosive um, bottle. So we would collect these, take them back to um, the mobile laboratory in which our instrument was housed. Um, and within about 10 or so minutes, we would get uh, detection traces that looked like this. So you can see as you go down this list that if you look at device one there, that that's the second trace from the top. We can see a very big nitrate peak and a very big ammonium peak, and that would suggest that that bomb was made from ammonium nitrate. Um, that is actually what it was made. So these were all done um, without knowing the identity of the explosive and confirmed within about 20 minutes of uh, receiving those samples back in that mobile laboratory. The last device there is interesting. Um, the, uh, the people who made the bombs um, were, were very impressed that within um, about 20 minutes, we were able to say, all of those ions in there, that there's nitrate, perchlorate, chlorate. Um, there's possibly some potassium, some calcium and some barium um, and maybe some ammonium. We're not quite sure on that because it's not a very big peak. Um, and they literally made this bomb out of all of the residue that they had left out of making the other one. So this was just a, hey, um, what's left over, just chuck it in and mix it up. Um, and so they were very impressed that again, within that 20 minute time frame, we were able to identify the composition of that bomb. Now the composition of a bomb is good after it's gone off because it lets you catch people um, who made that bomb. But it would be much nicer to be able to detect the bomb before it goes off. And that brings us to a completely different scenario where we now need to take into account the speed. So you may not have noticed, but those analyses were on the order of 20 minutes. Now, if you're at an airport um, and you get screened, you're not gonna be happy waiting 20 minutes. So this brings us to a new challenge of how do we do that analysis, not within 20 minutes, not within one minute, but maybe within 20 to 30 seconds. What we essentially have to do is take that whole analysis process and bultify the sample collection uh, and the analysis and to have that done in something that can be operated by somebody who is a real, not, not a trained scientist. 
So this was our home built, first home built system here. It's a slightly different design, but it's been designed for speed. It's been designed to make everything super quick so that we can maybe not get 20, 30 seconds to start with. We set ourselves a minute. Can we do this analysis in a minute? So this was our first system and this was our first result, which you can see here some black irons and some red irons. The red irons here are, are the explosive targets. The black irons are what we expect to be in the environment that might interfere um, with that analysis. So you can see here our detection limits were in the order of two to seven picograms, and that's about a hundred times lower than the current technology that's used um, in airplanes. So this means that we've got a better ability to be able to detect those explosives if we can actually now start and ruggedize this um, and get that all important sample interface. So how do you collect the sample and how do you get that into this system so we can do the 40 second analysis? That's, that's the other critical. We began working uh, with a company in Melbourne called Grain Innovation. And so this is uh, the first coupling of the extraction system, which you can see on the left, and our homemade system, which you can see in the right half of that photo. It's a little bit hard to see, but at the top of that left piece of instrumentation, um, there's a, a sort of a greyish box. In the greyish box, there is a white um, tube and sticking out of that white tube is actually uh, something that you would like clean your earbuds with. Um, that's what we were using to collect the residue from the surface. So you'd take that out, rub it on the surface, put it back into there. And then this particular instrument would then extract the explosive residues and then move it to our system for that 40 second analysis. So this is a slightly more engineered version of those two systems now. So you can see on the right, this is the sample extraction system that I was talking about. We now have a handle to hold that swab. Um, and then our homemade system was placed in a wine cooler to provide a little bit uh, more of a, a, a stable temperature to just improve the reliability of that system. After two, day, two days after getting that sampling interface, we had a, a scheduled range exercise in Canberra with the Australian Federal Police. So that system was actually pretty much sent uh, to us. We used it for two days and then packed it up and drove it to Canberra. Um, you can see that top trace here is a, uh, one of those explosive plates from a black powder device. What we were really much more interested though is that um, second trace there, which shows peak number three. Peak number three is a chlorate uh, residue. And so this was the hand of the bomb tech who actually assembled that explosive. So when I say assembled, he took the plastic bottle and he hung it above um, that, ex uh, that, that plate that you saw in the picture earlier. He didn't make the bomb, he literally just took the plastic container and tied it up. And we were able to detect the residue of that bomb on his hands. And this got uh, the AFP guys there super excited because we're now not talking 20 minutes. We're now talking, he comes straight off um, and we sample his hands. And before the bomb was detonated, we could say that it was likely to be a chlorate device, um, which it was. Um, and, and that just started to show the power of what we were trying to do. In, I think it's 2016, uh, this was engineered into a now a single box and this is uh, at some field testing uh, at an airport. Um, and then in 2018, the Grayscan product was launched by Minister Pine um, at the Grayscan manufacturing facility in Port Melbourne. That's the current prototype, uh, not the current prototype, sorry, that is the current product. Um, and last year we were awarded the 2019 Eureka Prize for Outstanding uh, Science for Safeguarding Australia because of the, I guess, decade journey from fundamental research to product translation. Just to give you an idea of what it does, um, you can see here, so the swab is now slightly different. It's a paper swab. It's now going into the instrument um, and it takes about a minute to do that entire analysis, um, but this has now got a lot more checks and balances to improve that reliability so that it works for anybody um, who would be using it. This has been uh, taken around the world a few times uh, and, at a, and at a couple of places, uh, there was a defense convention in France, I think it was, where uh, a serving military, uh, a serving uh, pilot, it actually was, um, was just recently back from Afghanistan and they swabbed him and were actually able to identify residues of some of the explosives under his watch um, from when he came back. So this is like weeks after um, he came back from uh, that particular environment. So that gives you an idea of the sensitivity with which we are able to detect some of these explosives. So you can see in this case, it comes up with a warning um, and there is the trace. 
uh, and the identification of all of those explosive targets um, and an estimated mass amount of what explosive might be there. So we are now looking at other applications of this technology. So we're partnering with the Australian Meat and Processing Corporation to look at whether we can use this uh, sampling system for bacteria detection to improve the uh, quality of our meat products. We're working with a major pharmaceutical company to look at uh, how clean their uh, reactor tanks are when they change batches, batches of production. Um, and we're looking at how we can use this platform as a way to detect viruses within a couple of minutes. And if we can do that, and I'm pretty sure that we can based on our results so far, um, that would lead to a, a new uh, way in which we could manage pandemics very quickly. So that was in an airport, and I'm going to shift slightly now to, to, to focus on our environment. And, and the focus now is not necessarily on answers within minutes, but more um, answers at the site over long periods of time, um, so that we're able to see changes within our environment. So this project came out of this same instrument that we built to go quick, um, because as we build it to go quick, it's also really small, um, and it's really small, low cost. And that means that we can potentially look at other applications. So the student who was doing this uh, work at the time decided to just see how many molecules he could separate. So you can see here that we got up to 24 different chemicals that we could analyze and quantitate within about a three minute time frame. Um, so we could do this every three minutes, give you information on the chemistry that's in there. So we actually set this system up and we're able to monitor tap water um, through the building over the weekend. We were running this about every five minutes, but we did not analyze all the data from that because that's a significant amount of data. So we, were, we just analyzed, I think it's about one every two or three hours and you can see those plotted here. Um, this is again, just for looking at the water chemistry, but this really did spur a new project of trying to make a super cheap, super portable system that we could stick out on our rivers and lakes and oceans and monitor the chemistry of our environment. So we've gone through three prototypes now. So our first version is that red box you can see up there. It was still powered by the mains and a little bit heavy. Our second version now actually scaled right back down to the size of a lunchbox. And our third version um, is about the same size, uh, but we've, uh, we've improved on the efficiency of our data collection um, and our uh, power utilization. This is the type of analysis we get. Um, so you can see the bottom uh, green one there is tap water that's been added with a, uh, an internal standard to just make sure that we do our quality assurance check every time it runs. We have added a particular chemical there to make sure it's functioning properly. And you can see the standards at the top, um, which are uh, common water um, chemicals, chemicals that are of interest in our waterways. We monitored this in the lab for one month on the tap water and you can see the data here. So fluoride, which is added to our drinking water is required to be within about a 0.1, 0.8 to 1.2 uh, milligram per litre range. Um, we can see consistently that's actually very, cons very uh, consistent within about 1.27 plus or minus 0.11. So um, we're probably a little bit out in the preparation of our standards. So we're in no way saying uh, that the fluoride measurement there is incorrect. We suspect we are the ones that are incorrect. Um, but our motivation here was just to, to show the stability of this system and the ability to collect this type of data over long periods of time. We actually then ran this continuously for six months. So this is between days 130 and 170. You can see there where we don't have data. Um, it's not because the instrument stopped running, it's because our data collection system on the computer stopped saving the data um, because the uh, software became conflicted and we're, we're chemists, not uh, computer scientists. So um, we would just restart the, the data collection saving software um, and it would continue on its merry way. We actually left this running for uh, 12 months um, without any failures of the instrument, only failures in the software. This is our latest prototype. We've now taken all of that and the reagents and packed it up in an ESCII with a new filter. Um, and so this is now a fully transportable system um, that we, as of about three days ago, have now deployed at the salmon ponds um, on the River Plenty, just outside of Hobart. Um, and we're going to be monitoring some of the water chemistry over summer um, using this particular system. One of the neat things that we've done, and this is by one of my PhD students, Gabby, is to develop a filter um, that is completely uh, non-mechanical. Uh, 
Um, so it has no moving parts, but we're able to filter out all of the particulate matter, as you can see here, going from that tap water sample um, to our clean sample on the other end. And that's really important for the longevity of our system. And one of the reasons why it's been able to run so long is because we can clean up that sample really well, which um, again means that we can do this autonomously in the field. This is some data just showing um, 14 days of sampling at my place uh, where I have a little dam. Um, just to check that before we actually deposited that up at the, um, the, the, the Tasmanian Sample Ponds test site. We've been working now for a while with um, Eco Detection on commercialising this, and they've actually deployed a couple of these systems, um, slightly larger than ours, um, in New Zealand um, on the Waikato River. So if you zoom in, uh, so this is, uh, I think it's on the North Island. Um, this is some uh, live data, and you can uh, go and have a look at the Eco Detection trace. Um, for nitrate, um, where they're actually measuring nitrate about twice a day uh, at the moment um, to look at information about the health of that waterway, particularly with regards to fertiliser and the movement of those nutrients through the system, which can lead to significant environmental damage through algal pollutions um, and other uh, environmental outcomes. We're also working uh, with eager detection on adapting the system now to heavy metal monitoring, uh, to personal uh, pharmaceutical and personal care products, uh, pesticides and herbicides, which I haven't got here, but we have a system where we can do um, 1080 and Roundup uh, quite nicely, um, and potentially uh, bacteria detection on this as well. Um, and we think we can actually, uh, again, do this continuously and autonomously with a deployment time frame of about six months without maintenance uh, to provide those um, you know, temporal and spatial information about our environment at a scale that hasn't, hasn't been possible before now. So just to finish up, I'd like to, to thank everybody who's done this work. And so that's my research group that you can see at the bottom of the slide there. Funding from the Australian Research Council um, and also the industry partners who have been involved in this. So that's Grey Innovation, Grey Scan and Eco Detection um, for uh, the explosives and the water monitoring system. Uh, and Trajan Scientific and Medical for the Hemapen uh, dried blood spot collection device. Uh, so that's it for me today. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you again and thank you uh, very much for listening.